So maybe as we as we start uh, things this evening, um, maybe we can just we'll start with you, okay. with Tim, and go we'll go back around the way. Your take on the status of things. You've been in more than one session. You mm -hmm. get a sense for what happens at what time and place. Uh, are we in a good place? Are we heading toward a reasonable adjournment and a lot done, or otherwise? Yes, I, I think we're in a very good place. You kind of look at probably the three major components. There's there's other bills, many other bills that are going through, but probably what gets talked most about is is we'll have this general omnibus bill, which which brings in a lot of the different committee spending. We have a little bit of a surplus, so there's going to be some. Uh, money attributed to whether it be transportation, education, some of the priorities of Minnesota. And then we have the tax bill, which is sitting there in a good place. Uh, I will say that, in my opinion, we need to come up with some tax conformity. We, uh, uh, the, the House and Senate and the governor may not totally agree on every component of it, but I can tell you for the citizens of Minnesota, we need to accomplish something or we're going to have problems going into next year particularly in tax filing season, and there's going to be some costs to farmers and other people. But I'm confident we can get that done. And then, of course, they kind of refer to this as, as the bonding year, if you will. And uh, I know the House, we passed off um, out of committee last week um, a bonding bill. We're going to be doing that next week, I believe. And it's my understanding, Senator, that you just worked, you brought, you brought to committee your bonding committee today today as well, correct? That, that's correct. Yeah. Well, Our, let's, let's go to Senator Westrom. And, same question about the tenor of things and where you're at. Uh, much to be done, but one of the big items is that uh, the bonding bill. Uh, Jim, there there was a bonding bill uh, came out of uh, proposed last week in the House, uh, this week in the Senate. Uh, the bonding committee in the Senate is actually there tonight, uh, marking up, uh, kind of putting their final fingerprints on the bo bonding bill, and certainly that it becomes probably the big focus of the session. The supplemental budget, as Representative Miller talked about. Uh, those are all supplemental items. We set the budget last year for two years, and so uh, there's not as many must-haves uh, or there's not a face, facing a, a shutdown or, or a funding problem if, if the supplemental budget doesn't get everything in it that, that there is. But, um, you know, I often analogize it to college or, or high school. Uh, the research papers always got done the last few days and the last week before they were due, they never got done at the beginning of the semester. And uh, the legislature's made up of a lot of people that went to college or high school, and the same <laughs> traits go on at the legislature. They, they've learned well, <laughs> you were saying. I can follow that, Jim. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. I'm going to steal that from you. That, that is like, the, yeah, we all wait, you wait till the last minute. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear the. The, you know the positiveness that's coming out about something getting done. I, I am, <clears throat> I'm pleased with our bonding response so far in the Senate. I mean, Senator Senjim has really done a, a yeoman's work on making sure that spread far and wide throughout the state. I, I wish it was over a billion. I wish we. I mean, we're probably the last time that this state's going to see our bond rating as high as it's ever been in the history of the state. And you know, I think we could we could make a, a higher bonding uh, count to it, but. You know, I, I, I understand the reasons why, because, you know, we have an election coming up and everybody's got to get their talking points and all those lit pieces, right? Let's, Tori and I don't have to worry about lit pieces now with these two guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> so well, that's wait always, two years. Wait, wait two, two years. years. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you think something's going to get done, because I just don't see the urgency quite right. And, and I think Tori put it into perspective. You know, those last four days are going to be really the last four days. I think there'll be some urgency. I'm really not, uh, I, you know, there's still a, a question on fiscal stability and, and what we're doing and, you know, the tax, do you conform or not conform? And there were some things in there that I just don't see as a benefit to Minnesota, but hopefully that stuff gets worked out. Tim, I, I hope the, the House and the Senate can work this out before the governor gets it, but um, I'm glad you guys are saying it's going to end on time. I just don't see anything happening at the end because I don't see the urgency quite right now, and uh, maybe that'll come up in, in a few more days. Well, we'll get one more <laughs> voice on that from Representative oh. Marquardt. Well, as said, it's certainly a bonding year, and, uh, you know, Representative Erdahl, Representative Hausman has worked really hard putting together a good bill, and uh, like the senator here, I'd, I think we can do a little better and a little bigger bill. I mean, interest rates are still low. Yeah. Contractors yeah. are hungry. It puts people to work in a statewide project. But I, I think we're pretty close. But actually, the other things we're dealing with is more of kind of a reaction. I mean, no one planned to do a tax bill this year until December 22nd when the federal government passed right. their tax bill. 
And as mentioned earlier, if we don't conform or do something, uh, it's going to increase taxes on 300,000 Minnesotans uh, around the state. So we have to do something there. And I'm, I'm on the conference committee on that bill. And we're, I'm confident we're going to get something done because all three plans, the governors, the House, and the Senate, all are kind of on the same page as far as separating from the federal government, uh, kind of doing our own things with personal exemptions and deductions and, and that type of thing, which is the way we had to go, starting with federal adjusted gross income. They differ a little bit after that, but I think we're close enough. And then the other thing with the uh, catastrophe in the Florida school, you know, led to a real emphasis this time on school safety. And both the House and the Senate and the governor have put out very good plans there for, and what I'm hearing from superintendents is in the schools, you know, as far as the facilities, even things like fortifying the locks on doors and making the entrances more secure, but also going to the personnel and dealing with the mental health issues and allowing, providing extra funding for more mental health counselors or school resource officers or whatever to make those schools safer. But um, I think we're going to get the things that have to be done, done. And, you know, some of the things might not get done. But I think we're going to do safe schools. I'm confident we're going to get a tax bill yet. And I think we'll get a bonding bill. You know, I do think with the, with the tax bill, what I'm hearing from all sides is, you hear different perspectives of how to achieve this, but we're trying to figure out, you say 300,000 households, correct, yeah. that are facing a tax increase, and we're trying to do as many as possible, either held harmless or maybe even a little bit of a, a tax break. But the tax breaks that we're seeing out of the house um, are really like a $50 tax break or 100 There's yeah. no one that's really cleaning up on this. I think where we, you know, I'm really glad that we were able to address a, a couple of things. It's called Schedule 119. I forget the number, but the but the equipment. The Section 179. Oh, section 179. Yes. Yes. I never yeah. remember the numbers. But yeah, that's all right. Right. <laughs> but, but that, but yeah, that's a very important thing in rural Minnesota. And, um, and of course, with manufacturers and stuff. And it's, those sorts of key elements, I think we're all agreeing on. And yeah. so I agree with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're in the tax committee and you're, you're feeling the same thing. I think we're going to be able to figure something out. Well, some things you bring it up, Tim, and I, and I look at the majority of folks get some small little tax breaks. But what, what was concerning within the Senate, and I don't know what the House tax bill looks like, but there's $80 million is going to go to the you know, top 800 highest uh, check earners if you look at how that tax bill was set up. And I'm just kind of perplexed on, especially when, when you're talking about um, giving a huge tax break to only 800 people within the state of Minnesota uh, versus the rest of it. The other thing that, that, that kind of scares me or causes me uh, on the, to have caution is, uh, you know, the premium, uh, uh, the premium piece that's in there. Right now we're at 3% uh, premium tax uh, rate. And you help me get that language right. All I know is it, it, it sures that minsure so people can oh, get within minsure. And that's going to get decreased, I think, 2% within the Senate bill. I don't know if your House bill does the same thing, but that has a scary piece to me saying that we are going to give money back to the HMOs. And already both parties will agree there needs to be more transparency within our HMOs. And the fact that, you know, they're sitting with the highest paid CEOs there are. There's no accountability to how our monies are being spent by those organizations. And yet when we start to see this premium rate go from 3% down to 2% or 3.5% down to 2%, that's money put back into their system, and it's not coming to the people of Minnesota. So I don't know if the House bill does that, addresses that at all? or No, it really doesn't. But, you know, normally we don't have to worry about the federal bill. But the federal bill, when you looked at it, and for better or for worse, is the emphasis was on the corporation tax. I mean, they got a 40% permanent tax rate cut. And I think that is going to help the economy. I think it will. But on the individual side, the the breaks, the tax cuts they see there are initially good, but then they evaporate over time. I mean, according to the Joint Committee on Taxation that really looks at this stuff, yeah. um, by 2021, if you're a household making 30000 or less, you're going to actually start seeing a tax increase. And by 2025, if you're 40000 or less, you'll see a tax increase. And by 2027, families 75000 or less will start seeing a tax increase. So really, after the federal bill, it was corporations won and working families and senior citizens nothing. nothing. And so I think on the state, and like I said, normally you don't, but I think we really have to emphasize and target that tax relief to those working families and senior citizens who each and every day around the kitchen table are struggling with a lot of costs. Yeah, yeah. Now we're kind of back to where I think where Representative Miller was introducing this, the, the word conformance. 
Uh, so we have to conform to the Fed, so we don't have to. But well, to the degree is what we're just talking Do we conform or not conform? What's well, the best interest and, in and, and I'm not on the tax right? committee. Yeah. Yeah. But, but conforming costs, uh, to not conform will cost yeah. a lot of yeah. people unintended co uh, but consequences. When, but when we use the term conformity, the way that I've understood it from Chair Davids, who's done a really good job of trying to explain everything to people, we can't truly conform. We could right. conform, but you're actually going to see increases for pretty much everyone. Yep. So what they, what it was explained to me is you're going to, and if you push here, it makes this move here, and if you spin this here, <laughs> yes. it makes that do that over there. And so uh, one thing that they really put their heart on is to, if the number one goal is to hold people harmless yeah, right, or to right. strive towards that. And um, so we had to pick and choose some things. They really broke it down well at the different levels of size households or income levels, things like that, and how can they affect positively the most number of people. And I think coming out of the House original bill, out of that 300,000 homes, we held all that it was about 24,000 or something like that mm -hmm. households, mm -hmm. harmless or tax breaks. In, in the Senate yeah. bill, 99.9% uh, of taxpayers right. were held harmless right. or received a, a reduction. Uh, one of the things that's in the Senate bill, uh, as John uh, was referencing earlier, but is a reduction in the low income tax bracket. So everybody that pays in the low bracket receives, and, and that includes anybody in the low, middle, or upper class, because they so all am, pay on that. Am I so. hearing now that you need to get to conference committee and hammer it up? Yeah. Well, that's where it is it's right in, now. It's, it's in the conference right committee now. right and now, I think and they're working it, it themselves. Tori was talking about, I think in that in that one, it was a like a $95 tax cut for the low-income folks. But, yeah, at right. least it's in there. You know, you're sitting there doing it's it, but the what right gets direction. me is the 80, $82 million that's going to go to the top 800 people that are, you know, wealthy heirs. Well, but one of the things that's a little bit distorted is, is someone that's making $20,000 is paying less taxes than someone that's paying $200,000. And so if you want to talk percentages, it probably does skew to that sort of thing. Yep. But by no means do we have someone that's sitting in their corporate office saying, wow, I just had my taxes cut in half. By far and away, the top 5% of the people in Minnesota pay the preponderance of the overall taxes in the state of Minnesota. And I'm not saying, therefore, they deserve to get the biggest cuts, but the numbers are going to be skewed just because of those percentages. Right, and I didn't, I wasn't, my whole point was that it's pretty, when you talk about especially disparity side of it, it right. you get to the equalization factor, and we, all of us live in property poor school districts. We know what equalized or unequalized right. taxes are. And in this case, I just am having a hard time wrapping my hands around $82 million go to 800 people. That's, that was my whole statement. It makes absolutely no policy sense for me, but you're right. correct on that well, other side.